Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Uh, we're happy to have um, Dr. Jean Mandernock here today. Um, she's Executive Director of the Center for Innovation in Research and Teaching at Grand Canyon University. Um, I attached her full bio uh, with the call information, so hopefully everyone got a chance to look at it. Um, she's an active presenter and consultant in the field of online education, and she serves on various editorial boards uh, that are in included in the bio. Uh, her presentation today is on 10 technologies to maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of online teaching. Uh, she said that she would answer questions during um, her talk, so if you can just type them in and then she'll repeat them and address any questions or concerns um, during her presentation. We are recording the presentation, so I just ask that if you are not talking, please mute your audio, okay? All right, thank you very much, and Jean, it's all yours. Thanks, Nancy. I'm excited to join you today, and I'm going to start with a question for you all. Go ahead and answer this question in the chat. How many hours do you think you work each week? Not, not your homework, but your at job, things you're required to do for work. What do you think is your average number of work hours per week? And I'll let you go ahead and share that in the chat. <laughs> Martine came in with too many. I think we can all relate to that as well. And while you're typing, I just want you to think about most of the faculty development or instructional presentations that you go to. We always talk about what we should be doing, pedagogical things, instructional things. But one of the things that we don't often talk about is our time. And time is a really important consideration when we start talking about what we can do to be more effective and more efficient in our teaching. Recent research finds that faculty on average work 61 hours per week. So Nancy's right in there. <laughs> she said 60 to 70. And you're right there with the average. 61 hours per week. And of that 61 hours per week, about 35% of it is spent on our teaching duties. And if we look at what we're doing with that time, it's about evenly divided between instruction, class prep, and course administration and grading. Now, as you're thinking about that, you might start to reflect on your own role. And this research was done specifically for campus-based faculty. So if we were going to do this math, that means somebody who is a campus-based faculty member on average is going to give about 21.35 hours a week to their teaching. So if we do our little math here, what that means is if you have a three-course load, you only have about seven hours a week for your course. If you have a four-course load, you only have about five. And some people are even working in a five-course load. And I didn't even do the math on that because I don't want to think about how many hours per week that means that you have for your teaching. Now, as you think about that, you might be saying, yeah, but that's campus-based faculty. It's a little bit different when we start talking about online teaching. And I would agree. And I've actually done quite a bit of research looking into that. And what we find is when we ask people who only teach online, if they're adjunct faculty, they're spending about 13 hours a week per class. And if they're full-time online faculty, so not physically located at a campus, but working full-time online, they spend about 11 hours a week. Well, I'm no mathematician, but even on the surface we can see teaching online takes time. And it takes a lot of time. And it mainly boils down to a fact that is not surprising at all for those of us that teach in the online world. Unlike the face-to-face -face classroom in which class ends when the clock tells you it does, there are no boundaries in the online classroom. There's nothing that actually tells us when to start or when to stop. And also, because we don't know what students are doing on the other end, we only know they're participating in our class when they leave a footprint, an artifact of some kind. So they leave it a message, they leave a discussion post, they complete a quiz, they submit a paper, but they do something. And everything that they do leaves an artifact that we need to deal with. And so when you put this all together, what happens is oftentimes we are overwhelmed. There's simply too much to do and not enough time to do it in. And so we could have presentation after presentation telling you about best practices. 
and we could talk about the new pedagogical techniques and all the different things that will make your online class really, really effective. But all of my research has told me faculty know what they need to do. They just don't have time to do it. There is a huge gap between what we know about best practices and what our actual practice looks like in the classroom. Because once we're in that classroom, there's a whole lot to do. We might have to be, you know, continually revising and developing our course. We might have to deal with technical challenges, simply facilitating our online discussions, grading or acknowledging or commenting on all of those artifacts that students give us, answering emails, answering questions, just generally taking care of our online courses. It takes a lot of time. And no matter how many things we add to that list, our available time doesn't change. Our available time still hangs somewhere. If we're gonna average out what full-time faculty tell us, campus-based faculty tell us, and adjunct online faculty tell us, right around 10 hours a week. So for the purposes of our conversation, let's just pretend we have 10 hours per week per course. And that's probably a generous assumption. So now we think in 10 hours, we have to do all of these different tasks. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Not so much what is the newest, latest, best practice, but how do we bring together that gap between what we know we should do and what we should actually be doing. Now I've done tons and tons of research asking faculty, where do you spend your time? And there are two things that consistently pop to the top of the list. Number one, grading and feedback. Faculty tell us it takes about 43% of their time in an online course. So 43% of that 10 hours. So let's just go with about four hours of your time. It's gonna be spent grading. The next large item, facilitating discussions. And that comes in at right about 29%. So now another three hours is going to be spent in your discussion threads. Seven of your 10 hours is taken with just two of those items on the list. So it becomes really, really important for us to figure out how do we maximize our time and how do we spend our time doing the things that matters. And there are lots of tools to help us out there. I noticed that several of people have commented, you know, they work in instructional design or faculty support. And so I'm guessing you're often helping faculty figure out what technologies they need to use. There are so many technologies. And we have to remember. Again, our time is limited. Every minute we spend learning a new technology, finding a new technology, figuring out a new technology, is a minute that gets subtracted from our available pool. So now if I spend just an hour a week looking at new technologies, learning new technologies, that's one less hour I have to teach. And let's remember, I only started with 10 hours. So now I only have nine. And I know that I'm spending seven of those nine hours on discussion, facilitation, grading, and feedback. That only leaves me two hours in the entire week to do everything else. One of the things I want you to keep in mind as we go through these technologies is a concept called Pareto's Principle. And Pareto's Principle um, emerged from economic theory in which Pareto said in many, many tasks, there are a few really important things that need to be done. And we'll spend about 20% of our time on those things, but they account for the vast majority of the results. And then we have all of these trivial things that we spend tons and tons of time on, but they aren't really producing anything. The point behind Pareto's principle is we need to make sure we're prioritizing our time on the vital tasks that actually produce results. And so when we talk about technology, we're not gonna talk about technology simply for the sake of technology. Technology alone has very little value. But when we can use a technology to solve a specific pedagogical task, then we can maximize the impact of that time. We can get more results for the time that we're going to put in. So with that said, let's get right to it. The first thing that we need to do in our online courses is increase students' engagement with course material. 
unlike a face-to-face -face classroom in which students are kind of a captive audience, the minute they step into our face-to-face -face classroom, they're kind of stuck with us until you know the time runs out, whether that's 50 minutes or 75 minutes. They're probably going to passively listen, whether they like it or not. They're likely going to take notes, but we get their time. In the online classroom, we don't. It's a click and go technology. If they start to engage with material and they don't find it engaging, they don't find it interesting, they're simply going to click somewhere else and move on to the next resource. They aren't a captive audience. So it becomes increasingly important that we make sure we're engaging our students with the content we put into our courses. There is absolutely no return on your instructional investment time on creating something students refuse to watch. No matter how good you think it is, if they don't watch it, there is no value and you've wasted your time. So we have to start thinking about how can we do more than just throw a video in the classroom. We know students like videos, videos are good, but putting it in the classroom doesn't tell us that they're doing something with it. It doesn't make sure we know that they've invested their time and energy into that resource. So one of the technologies that I like to use to drive student engagement, to make sure I can not only get them to respond and to actively think about the material, but also so I can monitor and ensure that they're engaging with it, is Edpuzzle. Um, the reason I like Edpuzzle is it's, there's a free version, even the cost version is relatively low cost, but it allows you to take an existing video and you can go through that video and you can annotate it. You can add questions that students have to respond to. You can add your own comments. It's like showing a video in class in which you can stop and talk about the video, ask students questions, and make sure they're truly engaging with the material. I'm not going to take the time today to look at each of these examples, but I will send out the PowerPoint so that if any of you think that's a technology I need, you can take a look at the example, go click on the technology and look a little bit deeper. The other thing I love about Edpuzzle from a time management point of view is we as instructors don't have to create all of our own instructional materials. We did a study a couple years ago to see the extent that students really wanted to hear from their instructor. And what we found was students do like hearing from their instructor. They like the personal connection. They like seeing a face, hearing a voice, feeling like they kind of know that professor. But given a choice between watching a video of an expert talking about their theory and watching your instructor talk about somebody else's theory, students prioritize hearing the expert talk about their own theory. So now let's bridge that gap and get the best of both worlds. First of all, as an instructor, I don't have to spend the time creating a video that already exists somewhere on the internet. I can go and find the really good videos. So we know students like that. They like those good videos, but they also like me. They like seeing me, hearing my voice. So now I can take Edpuzzle and I can go through and I can annotate and I can add those questions and I can add me talking about the video and it stops the video and in inputs those pieces of personality. We get the best of both worlds. Now there's nothing magic about Edpuzzle. There's a lot of other programs that will do this. So if your university has something like ILOS or a subscription to ILOS, it will do this as well. It's a great technology. PlayPosit will do the same thing. The key is to find a technology that allows you to customize existing videos to make them uniquely relevant to your course, to track the student engagement, and to do it in a time manner that's efficient for your schedule. So you can remove some of that content development, you can now turn it to customizing, and you can ensure that that time isn't wasted because you can monitor that students are actually using and engaging those videos that you create. The next thing that we can do is simply take advantage of all the information that's on the internet. There is so much information available too much, in fact, and that's where the challenge lies. Students have at their fingertips more information than we could ever possibly give them. And we live in a world of alternative facts and fake news and all kinds of things that makes one question, what, what do I pay attention to? What do I focus on? How do I even zoom in and narrow down this huge plethora of information that's available to me? One way to do that 
is to take advantage of the really good resources that are available and create interactive web quests for your students. Now you don't need to recreate this information. You simply need to guide students through it. Now web quests are more than just a guide. And you can do background on how to create a really good web quest. But what I like about Zoonal, it's a free technology that first of all, walks me through, if I'm not familiar with what a web quest is, it walks me through the steps of a web quest. And so now I can create an activity for students that gets them actively learning, actively engaging. I can utilize existing online resources and I can direct and guide students through that exploration. But I can do it in a manner that doesn't require me to create all of that content, but allows me to utilize what's out there. It also takes advantage of students' preferences for click and go learning. Because now I can say, I want you to go here, and I want you to look at this, and focus on this, and then I want you to go here. How does this relate together? And you can put in questions, and you can put in comments, and you can guide them through this exploration of existing resources. The other thing that I love about Zoonal is because it's free, I can also assign students to create this material. So now I can actually have students be co-creators of the content that we're going to explore. So sometimes in my class, I'll have an assignment that says, your assignment is not to write me a paper about X. Your assignment is to create a web quest. And then I talk to them about the skills that's involved in doing that. You have to understand what are the key learning principles? What are the steps that would get somebody there? What is the difference between a good resource and a poor resource? The fact that students can navigate and go through all this and figure that out and put it together is a learning experience. So now the students create the activities. And I even cheat and go a little bit further. Any given course, I'll assign them to create the Zoonals. And then when the students create really good ones, and every single time I do this, I'll have a few really good ones. Don't get me wrong, we also have some bad ones. But we'll have a few really good ones. And then I'll reach out to that student and I'll say, that was really, really good. I would like to request your permission to use that in future courses. And I've never had a student tell me no. Quite the opposite. They've came back and they've said, wow, this feels so authentic. This, this was like meaningful. And then they'll come back and say, can I use this? Like when I'm putting together my portfolio, would you be willing to write me a letter of recommendation? Because they feel like they're doing something of value. And from my time point of view, they've now done some of my work for me in a manner that was really beneficial for them. It's a win-win situation. Another one, and this is one of my go-tos. This is one of the most frequently used technologies that I do, uh, Screencast-O-Matic. And again, any screen capture program will work. So if your institution already has access to a screen capture program, um, I mentioned ILOS earlier. Many campuses have a site license for ILOS. It will also do screen capture. The idea is we don't need to spend our time repeatedly trying to type something out and explain it to students if we can simply demonstrate it for them. And Screencast-O-Matic is so simple. I have more screencasts than I care to even admit to people because I do a screencast for my syllabus when I literally just pull my syllabus up on the screen and I click and I talk and I walk and I make big arrows and I say, look at this, don't forget this, this is where students lose points, here's the calendar, print this out, I have like a triple whammy benefit of this. First of all, I prevent questions from coming to me in the future. So I cut down on future emails, future problems, future what ifs, because I've gone through the syllabus and answered all of those common issues in advance. The second thing is it allows me to give them the syllabus in a more engaging manner. We all give our students a syllabus and they often ignore it. <laughs> they don't even read it. I mean, as we say all the time, if we could just get them to read our syllabus, that's half of the battle. And so um, walking them through ensures that they're having an opportunity to see that syllabus, even if they refuse to read it. And then the last part, Screencast-O-Matic tells me the number of views that I get. So now I can see whether or not students have read the syllabus or watched my screencast, seen that information or not. And I can even add a syllabus quiz to the end to make sure that they can um, address and identify some of those key issues that come up. I use screencasts all the time for demonstrating things I want students to do that I know are problematic. 
So not only do I have a screencast of the syllabus, I have a screencast that I walk them through our course. I have screencasts where I show them how to use the library database. And before you build that, check your library might already have one. Don't waste your time creating something that already exists. I have screencasts where I pull a journal article up and I walk them through how I critique and analyze a journal article to know whether it's a good one or not. I have screencasts showing them how to do APA style. I have screencasts for almost every question that students have brought to me in the past. When I have questions that repeatedly pop up term and term again, I just go back and I answer it via screencast. Sometimes I'll embed that into the course to try to prevent that question. Sometimes I'll just go ahead and keep that. Um, and now I have it to pop in when they send me an email and it's much, much quicker for me to answer that email than it is to create that again. Um, and there was a question, is this similar to Camtasia? Camtasia also has options that will allow you to do screencasting. Camtasia, I think, now will even allow, allow you to annotate the videos as well. So yeah, any screencast program that will do this. Another one, and I'm gonna mention this one in a moment here that I like that does screencasting is Loom. And Loom is a, a Chrome plugin um, that's also really easy. So there's nothing magical about Screencast-O-Matic. What I think you have to think about from a time savings point of view is how do I capture their attention to make sure they're seeing it? And how do I demonstrate it to them? And how do I personalize it? Because if you can do those three things, you're going to cut down on the ongoing questions that you have. The other place I do a ton of screencasts on is statistics. I teach statistics. Students do not for the life of them understand statistics, nor do they understand SPSS. And trying to type and explain that information is more challenging than just showing them how to do it. So I can just pull it up on my computer screen and I can do it. You can also cheat and use any kind of screen capture program to narrate PowerPoints. So if you have a really good PowerPoint, just pull up a screen capture and you can talk as you walk through that PowerPoint and it just nicely packages it together in a video for you. And it takes no thought, which is what I love about it. So it takes me no time to learn the program. I don't have to edit the program. I have to start it and I have to stop it. And that's about it. I'm going to take a moment here and I'm just going to quickly glance through the chat. If you had a chat question that I missed, um, please pop it up there again because I think I have hit all of them, but just in case. Yeah, if I keep talking and I miss your question, pop it in there again. So here's another one that I like. And what I love about Movely is I work from home. And so I'm not always camera ready. And I oftentimes want to create just this quick piece of content and I want to talk about it and I want to walk them through it, but I don't really have a PowerPoint, nor is a PowerPoint that engaging. And I definitely don't want to turn on my webcam because I'm not shower ready. But Movely allows me to create engaging animated little quick videos that look very fancy. They look like something students would create, but I can do it without ever having to turn on the webcam and I can still add my voice. So if I'm just wanting to do a quick piece of custom learning content, Movely is also one that students respond really well to. PowerPoint feels a little bit old to students. It doesn't seem engaging. It's not snazzy. Movely feels a little snazzier. So it allows you to create that custom learning content in a manner that is quick, it's easy, and it feels more like what students are looking for. I've also found, just like I said with the WebQuest, students are really good at creating Movelys. Um, there is a free version that allows for some limited use. And so I'll have students create an account with that free version. And frankly, students can create better Movelys than I can. And so I have some courses in which I'll give them optional assignments. I don't like to make my courses, you know, this technology smorgasbord where they have to learn all these varied technologies. But sometimes I'll have an assignment that will say, you have a choice. You can demonstrate your knowledge by writing this paper by creating this Movely or by creating this video. And I'll outline exactly what the, the kind of guidelines are for the assignment and I'll let students choose which one they wanna do. Students like the Movely. And even though it took me a little bit of time to initially learn it, I will give you that caveat, it's a little bit of a up cycle on learning the time. Once you learn it, it's quick and easy. Students said it was much, much quicker for them. Um, and there was a comment here that 
Jennifer said her son helped her to rip a clip and upload it using screencast, but he found it challenging. Um, so it'd be nice to investigate if there's a collective possible use. Yeah, great comment. Thank you. Now here's one I'm going to mention with caution, because the point of our presentation time together today is efficiency. And this is the one technology I'm going to tell you that can backfire on you and can actually waste your time rather than saving it. And I'll give you my, my horror backstory on that. Video mail simply allows you to create a quick video without any upload or download. You can just click a button that says start recording. When you hit stop recording, it'll just say send email. And it automatically sends that email to the person with the video right in the email. And then it gives the receiver the option to hit a button that says reply via video. And so what it essentially is, is an asynchronous video conversation that you can go back and forth with. So the first time I came across this, I thought, wow, this is so fun. This will be a great way to personalize my course. I'm going to just start my course with a video mail message. And so I sent out one video, but I sent it to the entire course. Now I did it as a BCC, so each of them felt like they were receiving it individually. And I had a course of 25 students. They were all online. And then I sent it out, and I didn't really think about the fact that they would feel compelled to respond, because I've always sent out a welcome email. And I've hardly ever had a student respond to my text-based welcome email. So I didn't think about it. So I sent out this video mail to my 25 students. 23 of the 25 responded with their own video. Of those 23, several of them asked me another ongoing question that required me to now respond to them again. And then they responded back and it turned into the never ending video conversation. Now the nice part was it really did feel personal and it felt touchy feely and it was almost like running into a student in the hallway and having a nice conversation. The bad part was it took so much time. So I don't actually recommend this as a time saver for the whole class kind of communications. On the other hand, we've often been in those situations where we're emailing back and forth with a student and there's just a disconnect. Like we've emailed several times and we're not resolving the problem. We're not, we're, we're not seeing eye to eye for whatever reason that's when video mail is your time saver. I use what I call the rule of three. If I have sent three emails back and forth with a student on the same topic and we're still not getting it, either they're not understanding or we're miscommunicating, after three, now I'll send a video mail. Very, very rarely does it require ongoing after that point. It seems like having that face and that voice can just reduce the misunderstandings and make the communication so much easier. Video mail, I do not use very often, but when I do use it, it seems to really help and streamline. The other thing I find is it reduces students' frustrations. So when I have a student that's getting angry and they're getting frustrated and I can feel that situation escalating, we know that when a situation escalates, it takes a lot of time to resolve and deal with. So if I can use a video mail and pop in and save that from escalating, I'm actually just going to save that future time investment. So use it sparingly, but have it in your pocket for when you need it. Uh, and Nancy had a great question. Are all of my students completely online? Mine are. I have absolutely no face-to-face -face time with my students in a synchronous fashion. So I'm completely remote with online students. Now here's one that every instructor needs to have. I don't care if you're face-to-face, -face, online, hybrid, blended, or something else. We all need to be using text expanders. If there is one program on this list that can truly revolutionize your time investment, it's going to be a text expander. Now, the text expander I happen to use is Phrase Express. I will tell you, there is nothing that makes Phrase Express better or worse than any of the other text expanders. It just happens to be the one I started using several years ago, and I'm comfortable with it. Um, it's intuitive, it's easy to use, it's flexible, so I like it. That can probably be said of most of the text expanders. So if you have a different text expander that you like, use whatever text expander you have. There's Brevity, there's Type It In, there's Type It For Me. 
Um, now even built into Turnitin, they have a feedback bank manager with some text expanders. Essentially, text expanders allow you to give really good grading faster. The first time you teach a course, it becomes really, really clear that students make relatively consistent types of errors. Now, not every student is going to make the same errors, which is why we can't simply give the same mass feedback to every student. But if we look across the whole spectrum of the pieces of feedback we give and the comments we make, it's very, very rare that a comment is only going to apply to one student. So when you take the time to make a really good comment, you want to save it and you want to use it again. And so a text expander simply allows you to save that piece of feedback and the next time you need to use it, rather than having to go and copy and paste that feedback and pull it in from a copy and paste, which you could do, it makes it faster. Now you can have a couple hotkeys or a code associated with each of these. And now you just use your codes and you use your hotkeys. And you can pop in entire paragraphs with three or four keystrokes. I have created my own feedback banks for APA style. I have them for writing comments. I now have them for almost every assignment that I have for the specifics of that assignment. So now I can be using my APA style comment hotkeys, I can be using my writing hotkeys, I can be using my assignment hotkeys, Phrase Express manages it all, and I can use really good feedback, and so it's really rich, but it's much, much faster. The other thing that I like about using a text expander rather than Microsoft Word autocorrect, which I'll mention that again in a minute, is a text expander program works in pretty much any application. So it'll work right in your LMS, it'll work in your email, it'll work in your discussion threads, it works everywhere. So now no matter where you're at, that same set of hotkeys will work to allow you to import those big chunks of feedback to make it personalized to that student, but it streamlines those repetitive pieces of information. Now, if you don't have access to a text expander program and you don't want to invest in one, you can use Word's Microsoft Word's autocorrect feature and you can trick it into being a text expander for you that works when you're in a Microsoft product. So if anybody's interested in that, you can let me know later and I'll tell you how to do that. Personally, I like using the text expanders and the one in Turnitin is great. Um, most of the different plagiarism, plagiarism management softwares now have at least some capacity for managing feedback banks that way. But again, when we spend 43% of our time on grading and feedback, streamlining that can be a huge time savings for you. Another one that I like is Web Whiteboard. And this one I like because it's free and it's easy and I don't have to install anything and my students don't have to install anything. So if I just wanna make a quick demonstration I can pull up a web whiteboard, I have a touch screen monitor, I can just use my finger and I can literally point and move and talk and it picks it all right up. I can also give this to students as a tool when I'm giving them projects that require collaboration and it allows them to draw and write and see things together. Where I found the most benefit in my class is using this for pre-writing activities. So a lot of students, in my discipline have to write literature reviews. And literature reviews are hard for them. It's hard for them to synthesize information and to see the big picture and to pull it all together. And so I'll give them an assignment where they have to create a whiteboard of it. And so they literally have to map it out and they have to show the connections and the big pictures and they draw the lines and they erase things and they move it together. But they can make a web whiteboard of that process and of them going through that and it just pulls it all together. You can do it synchronously, or you can do it asynchronously and save it as a video afterwards. Again, any whiteboard probably allows you to do this. The reason I like web whiteboard is because it's free and I don't have to install anything. So it's just an, an easy factor. Another program that I'm using more and more all the time is Pindex. Pindex is like the child of a web quest and Pinterest. It's like the educational version of Pinterest. The reason I'm starting to use Pindex more is because sometimes I don't need a full-blown web quest. 
I don't need them to have all the activities and the interaction and the overarching goal that's involved in a web quest. But I want to take advantage of some really good websites and I want to guide students through that. Pindex allows you to pin different websites, pin videos, pin anything you can find online. So just like Pinterest, you can pin it. Unlike Pinterest though, within a board, you can now organize that information into a specific order that requires the user to go through it in that order. You can embed questions, you can put in quizzing, you can monitor their use. So sometimes if I just want students to go through some websites and I wanna make sure that they've done it, I will just put it into a Pindex board and then I will add a little quiz right at the end. And I'll do that as an instructional module because now I know they've looked at the material, I have a quiz that tells me that they've covered it and it takes very little time on my part. I've also found that students are really good at making Pindex boards. And there is educational value in me giving them a rubric about how to evaluate a website. And there's lots of these rubrics available online. You know, how to evaluate for its relevance, for its content, for its um, currency, all of these different things. And so I'll give students a rubric on information literacy. And then I'll give them another rubric on understanding the concept that we're focusing on and I'll assign them to create a Pindex board. And I'll tell them, here's how you make a really good quiz question. And, and I can give them a rubric on you know, multiple choice quiz development. And I'll say, if you really truly understand this material, you should be able to build a board that walks people through that, design questions that really focus on the important parts. And um, thus far on our data, what we find is students engaging in that activity has just as much benefit as any of the other kinds of assignments that we get. So we found no engagement difference between a traditional written paper and developing a Pindex board. We found no differences in student um, learning outcomes on a final exam as a function of whether they did a Pindex board or a paper. But what we did find was students liked doing a Pindex board more. It was novel. It was different. So they learned as much, but they did it in a way that allowed them to think about the material differently. Now, if one of your learning objectives is writing, Obviously, that's not going to be as helpful. But if it's anything that's about a content and understanding information, this is a really good opportunity. The other thing I found is I'm using it a lot for the individualized learning opportunities. So there's often times that students are in a different place with their learning. Some students need more help than others. And so I'll embed Pindex boards within my content and I'll say, if you can answer the following three questions correctly, move on, you're good. If you can't, here are some Pindex boards that will give you more information and background to get you up to speed. So rather than waiting until the end and having students at a different place, I try to do a little bit of scaffolding and mastery learning approaches to provide these individualized opportunities for students to catch up their knowledge. And then another one, the one I like is Zoom. It can be any video conferencing um, software that you have. So if your university has a different one, but I think it goes back to that idea that there's times in which we can most quickly send an email. And if that's the quickest, easiest way to communicate with your students, do it. But oftentimes things are too complex. We need to understand what they're thinking. We need to see the points of confusion. And so sometimes we're gonna to wanna to do that live right now. And so if that's happening, I hold office hours and I use Zoom for my office hours. Now I'll tell you, students, almost never use the office hours. But for the few times that they do, the benefit is huge in terms of reducing the ongoing emails that I'm going to have for students that are confused, as well as reducing the feedback time that I'm going to spend correcting those errors when they've made them on an assignment. The other thing that we've found with Zoom, or not with Zoom, it's actually with any video conferencing, the idea of synchronous office hours is even though students don't use them, they like to know they're there. It's almost like a safety blanket. So what I do is I schedule office hours. At times I know I'm sitting at my computer anyway. The vast majority of the time there's nobody there. And students still tell me, I really appreciate that you were always available for us those two hours a week. I always knew I could come to you with a problem. And I tell students, if you don't seek out help ahead of time and then have problems, I'm not gonna be as understanding and I'm not gonna spend as much time on the back end fixing those problems. 
So part of it is setting up that atmosphere of support and preventing problems before they occur and getting students on the same page. So again, students don't necessarily take advantage of it a lot, but they like to know it's there. And for those that are struggling, this is much, much faster than a series of ongoing emails. And then our last one, and I mentioned this one earlier, is Loom. And I like Loom because it is so darn quick. Somebody mentioned earlier, you know, that when they did a screencast, but then there was kind of this upload, and there was this download, and you had to rip it, and there was, there was steps involved. And so there was a little technology on the back end. What I like about Loom is there's no steps involved. Loom is a plugin. So you install it on your computer, and it shows up as a little button up in the upper corner of your screen. When you click on that button, it automatically pulls it up and it says, do you want to make a video? Do you want to make a web, qu web quest? What do you want to do? Do you, or not web quest, sorry, screencast? What do you want to do? And so you click whether you want webcam, whether you want a screencast. I use this a lot for grading. It's another really quick way to do my grading. I'll pull the student's paper up, I'll flick on Loom, and I'll just talk them through their paper. Lots and lots of feedback as they hear my voice. The minute you hit the button that says you're done recording, Loom says, okay, here's your link. And it automatically gives me a link. I don't have to download, I don't have to upload. I just have a link, it's automatically copied to my thing. I can now just paste that wherever I need to be. So I can paste that in an email, I can paste that in a discussion thread, I can paste that into their grading comment box, which is where I use it most frequently. And the other thing I love is Loom tells me whether or not they viewed it and it tells me how many times they've viewed it. So when I give feedback on a paper, I can actually know, go back and I can just glance at my Loom records. So once you have an, a Loom, Loom account, it keeps all of your recordings in your account. I can just go back and glance at it and I can look and I can see they have not looked at it at all. It has zero views. And so then if a student comes to me with a question, I can respond and say, yeah, that'd be great, but start by looking at your feedback. I, I can see that you haven't looked at your feedback yet. The other thing I like is for students that do look at the feedback, and our data right now is showing about 70% of students do watch their video. So 30% still aren't looking, but 70% are watching their video. And of the 70% that watch it, they're watching it on an average of four times. They like it, they're engaging with it, they're using it. Now, they might be reading my written feedback four times as well. I'm not sure, I don't have a way to monitor that. But using Loom to make that video feedback is a quick way that I actually do know that they're seeing the information. Now I'll say I lied a little bit. I told you that was your last technology, but I wanted to throw in one more bonus goal. Oftentimes we just need to make sure they're reading. We need to make sure they're opening their textbook. We need to make sure they're watching their videos. Here's a really nice program, Educate Play that allows you to create interactive quizzes. Now, if you have something in your LMS that will already let you do this quickly and easily, stick to your LMS. Don't learn new technologies that you don't need to learn. But if your LMS doesn't have a really good quizzing feature, here's one you might wanna check out. It lets you do video quizzes, it lets you do interactive maps, it lets you do sorting. It's just a really nice, rich way of making sure that students are interacting. And, and touching that and knowing your content. Interestingly enough, we have data upon data that tells us the best way for students to learn is to read. That's it, just to read. We also have tons and tons of data that tells us students won't read. <laughs> students just don't like to read. But if we force the reading by making them answer questions or do an activity that requires that content, then we can get them to engage with that reading. Um, Couple questions about Loom. Yeah, Loom is free. Now Loom, Loom is kind of a unique option because Loom gives you so many free minutes. But then rather than purchasing additional minutes, you get more minutes by use. So the more you use it, the more free minutes you accrue. You also can get free minutes via referrals. So let's say you use Loom and you tell your friend, wow, Loom is really great. Or for those of you that are instructional designers, you tell your faculty, Loom is really great. Now they start using it and you get minutes. I don't push my username on people at all, and I've never ran out of my free minutes. So I, there, there are limits at some point. I think if you decided you were gonna sit down and make you know, 22 hours of Loom videos and never have a view and never have a referral, you're gonna run out of minutes. 
but there's not a monetary cost involved with Loom at all. So great questions. As we reflect on all of these technologies, I want to refer to another principle that it's important to keep in mind. Parkinson's law essentially tells us any task takes as much time as we leave for it. So if we don't know where we're spending our teaching time and we don't know how much time is available to us, we are going to waste a ton of time. As an example, we did a study a couple years ago in which we were, um, these were doctoral faculty, so they were grading research papers, and we asked them, how long do you spend per research paper? Um, they were telling us on average it was about an hour per research paper they were spending grading these papers. And so we said, okay. So we said, we'd like you to try to do it in 30 minutes. And all of the faculty that were in our study told us it's not possible. And we said, well, would you just try? And they said, okay, I'll try. They were all able to grade it in 30 minutes when they had a clock going and they knew that there was a goal. They knew that they had a, an exact mission they were trying to accomplish. And then we said, can you do it in 20 minutes? And again, they all told us, oh my gosh, no, I've already cut my time in half. There's no way I can go faster. They were all able to get it done in 20 minutes. So then the question becomes, yeah, but is it just as good? And so we gave them to independent raters. They didn't know how long they had spent grading each of these papers. And what the independent raters found was there was no significant difference in the quality of feedback as a function of whether it took an hour, 30 minutes, or 20 minutes. The difference was the mental mindset of the faculty members. And so not only is it nice to have technology tools that you really actively use in the classroom, but I think it's also important that you think about what tools you use to manage your own time and that we have guidelines on when we're starting and when we're stopping and on how long things should take us to complete. I'm not gonna go through all these technologies. You can explore them for yourself later, but I think it's important that we think about what is my teaching schedule? Do I even know? Do I know how many minutes I'm spending on a paper? Our time is like our money. If you don't have a budget, it just somehow disappears. And if we go back to Pareto's principle, we end up wasting a lot of time on things that have no impact in the end. So we need to maximize our time. We need to structure our time, schedule our time, and really focus on teaching on the times that we're teaching. And then when we're not teaching, we need to not focus on it. We need to build some barriers and walls to make the online classroom manageable. I have a little meme here on the screen, and I'll give you a moment to read that. And I'll read it out loud for those of you that perhaps have it on a small screen and can't see. It says, NASA discovered that ballpoint pens would not work in zero gravity. To combat the problem, NASA scientists spent a decade and 12 billion to develop a pen that writes in zero gravity, upside down, underwater, and almost every surface, including glass and at temperatures ranging from below freezing to 300 degrees Celsius. And the Russians used a pencil. Now you might be asking, what is the point of this? Well, first of all, I'll tell you it's not even true. Um, <laughs> that's a lie, as so many of the memes are, and yet that's irrelevant to the point of my story. The point of the story was we should not be wasting time and energy on anything that doesn't need it. If we've only got those 10 hours, we need to make sure our use of technology is very, very intentional. We should never start with the technology and then think about how we might use it. You need to start with your pedagogical problem. What are you struggling with? What are your students not engaging with? And then you need to ask yourself, will the technology save me time? Will it help students learn? Or will it engage my students? If those questions aren't yes, one of those questions, it either has to engage students, help them learn, or save you time, then you probably don't need to use the technology. You only have 10 hours. And if we look at how successful faculty spend that those 10 hours, you've got about four hours to grade, about three hours to interact, and a little bit of time left over for email, course administration, and content development. Spend that time wisely. Start with the pedagogical problem and ask yourself, can technology help me solve that? It is not a silver bullet. There's no technology on here that's going to magically make your day easier. But if you have a specific problem, 
that technology can help you address, then you can start to save time. Now, there's lots and lots of pedagogical issues we're working on, and this is a constantly under development program called Pedagogy First that simply walks them through if you have pedagogical problems, which technologies might you want to investigate. Um, you can go check it out and play with this later. It's free, it's on our website. It's changing all the time as we're trying to develop it. But we have to start with the pedagogy and the technology has to be the solution. It can't drive what we're doing in our classroom. So with that said, I'm just gonna wrap it up, um, open things up for questions. I'm gonna skim back through the chat and see if there's a few that I may have missed. And as, as I'm doing that, feel free to type in any others. Um, a question, when I introduce a new technology, do I offer it as extra credit? I typically have not offered it as extra credit. I've offered it as an option. So I'll do one of, I'll take my traditional assignment I've always used, and that's one option. And I'll add the new technology option as the other one. And I'll tell students they can pick. So I'm not a big extra credit person, but I do um, offer it as an option. And then the people that take that option, I will ask how it went, how it didn't go. And if we had trouble with it, I'll adjust their grade accordingly. I'm not gonna penalize them for, for being a guinea pig and trying things out for me. But yeah, good question. But I think you could try it as extra credit. I also have one faculty member I work with who has a TA. I don't have that luxury, but they have an undergraduate TA and their undergraduate TA's job is to be a guinea pig on all these technologies. So she'll assign it to her TA and say, I want you to keep track of your problems. I want you to keep track of your questions. I want you to keep track of how much time you invested. Tell me everything. And she kind of works out the kinks with her TA before she ever puts it into the classroom. In her case though, the reason she has a TA is because she has classes of almost 100 students. I don't have classes that large. My classes tend to be between 20 and 30 students. And so with a large class, she doesn't want to take the risk, nor would I advise her to take a risk of a new technology without piloting it, because if it goes wrong with 100 students, that's gonna be a huge time commitment to fix. So yeah, so I think it depends on your context. So if you have a small class, extra credit might be great. Um, or you could use it as an assignment option. If you have a large class, maybe you're gonna wanna go to pilot it out ahead of time just so that you don't uh, get in over your head and regret ever giving it a try with lots of students. The other thing I will point out, and this is not unique to any of these, but oftentimes we do the whole like, what's free and I'm gonna go with the free things. And free is great, I love free, but, when we use free things, we also have to remember we have no control over it. So I've also invested time creating things on free sites and then that free site goes out of business and all my stuff is just gone. So even though I do use free things, I think we have to remember our time investment. If I'm gonna invest a lot of time, I'm probably gonna to wanna to use a site that costs me a little bit of money to make sure there's some stability, not only of my content, but that I'm gonna be able to access it and get to it from there on out. If it's something that does not take very much time, then I'm all about the free. Or if it's something I want my students to do, then I'm all about the free. But I get worried when I invest a lot of time into a free product just because I know I, I don't have any you know, stake in the game here. If this company gets bought out, sold, whatever, my content could disappear with it. Well, I'll, I'll leave it open for questions and people can feel free to pop in with more questions. I did put my email up on the screen, so if anybody wants to follow up later or continue the conversation, they're welcome to. Okay. Great, thank you so much, Jean. Um, we will send out a survey after the webinar. It'll probably be on Monday, and then hopefully next week sometime, everything will be posted on our website, and I'll let everyone know um, when all of that's done. So thank you very much, Jean. This was wonderful. Thank you. All right, great. Have a great weekend, everyone. And as everyone's logging out, Nancy, I'll just kind of hang on the line here in case something pops up, but. Yeah, yeah.